talking about work matters. Open them to Colossians chapter 3 or Ephesians chapter 6 or both. Did you know, before we get to that, while you're turning, did you know that on average we Americans spend 50 hours a week? It's, uh, it's, it's, it varies. Some of them say 49, some of them 56. About 50 hours a week at work. That's a big chunk of your time. If you're working from Monday to Saturday, six days a week, because we just ended our series on Sabbath. If you're following that, and there's six days in a week that you are working, you're probably on average working about 8.3 hours a day on average, if you're working Monday to Saturday. More than that if you're working just Monday to Friday. So it really is a big chunk of your life a big chunk of your time, a big part of what you are doing. Now, after talking about the Sabbath principle, we need to turn attention now to work, because a lot of us work. How many of you work? How many of you are looking for work? How many of you are overworked? <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Jesus is your boss. And then turn over to Ephesians. Head back a little from your Bible. If you're using one of those paper things, turn back a few pages. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 6. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Work matters. Let's pray. Father, add now the your blessing, your special blessing upon the reading and study of your word. Help us to understand work as you have designed it and help us to enjoy it as you have willed it. In Jesus' name, amen. Work matters. You know, in August 1942, wow, that's a long time ago, Navy signalman, third class, Elgin Staples, Navy. He was serving aboard the USS Astoria. They were attacked by the Japanese cruisers in the famous, what we now know as the Battle of Savo Island. In one missile attack, Staples, signalman Staples, was blasted overboard from the USS Astoria. He was alive, but he was badly injured, and he was floating in the water only because of his inflatable rubber life belt. More than 200 men died that night. Four hours later, towards the morning already, they were rescued by the USS Bagley, and he, they were brought back to the heavily damaged ship, the Astoria. They were attempting to beach the Astoria off the shallow waters of Guadalcanal, World War II. And as they did that, the Astoria started to lift and it started to sink. So in a span of just several hours, Signalman Staples was in the water again, still injured, and still held afloat only by his inflatable rubber life belt. I'll tell you the rest of that story, how it ends. But we know that that was Signalman Staples' job. That's his work. It's dangerous as a soldier, as a Navy person. It was life-threatening, but that was his work. That was his job. For something that makes up a huge portion of our lives, we have got to develop the right attitude towards work. I mean, it's occupying a lot 
of your time. You have either got to get rid of it if you're, not, if you're having the wrong attitude or develop the right attitude, the right biblical attitude towards work. You just got to get this right. We need the right perspective. We need the right tools for something this important. We cannot leave work just to chance, just to luck, just to a necessity. Work matters. Today, I have two goals for us. <clears throat> Let me show you the two goals if it cooperates. We need to kind of move it maybe. Just move it. Click it. I'll just signal it to you. Not working? Uh, the first goal is to adopt a biblical attitude towards work. What does the Bible say about your work? For something important that that's a part of your life, you need to adopt a biblical attitude towards it. Number two, I want to encourage you, those that are discouraged, those that are looking for work, or that are really down because of work, I want to encourage you to develop a healthy Christian work ethic. There is such a thing. There's a Christian ethic. There's a healthy Christian work ethic. And we have to strive to develop both. Number one, <clears throat> this is one perspective. We're looking at work, and this could be the reason why you're suffering, you're enduring. You're looking at work or your work as a painful punishment. You're saying, well, that's, that's how it is. It's a curse. It's like a curse. We handle it like a curse. We look at it as a curse. We look at it as a punishment. Therefore, even from the get-go, you're suffering. It's like a prison term. A prison term for disobeying and the consequence of our sin. This perspective about work, this perspective about any kind of job, stems from a misunderstanding of the story of Adam and Eve. I'll, I'll show you the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and then chapter 3. I'll see and read to you excerpts. See where we get this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it. In other versions, have dominion over the earth. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. See that? Then we go over to Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, then 15. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not sent rain on the earth, there was no man to work the ground. Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So we see in Genesis 1 and 2 that from the beginning, God planned to partner with man to have dominion, to rule, to subdue, to make fruitful his creation. When God created that garden, when God created the earth, he, after all of that, created man and said, you take over this. I will, I will work with you. I will partner with you. I am the creator. I am the maker. You are my creation. But you are over all of this. Take care of it. That's going to be your work. That was going to be Adam and Eve's work. That was going to be man's work to cooperate with God for the care of and fruitfulness of creation. What's notable here? Work came before the fall. 
work, the dominion, the rule of man over creation, and how we are supposed to make it fruitful for our benefit and for the glory of God, came before sin entered. Work is not equal to the curse of sin. You get it? It was before that. Genesis chapter 3 came in after that. Genesis chapter 3 is the record of man's fall. Look at Genesis 3. To Adam, when God, when they sinned already, and God was looking for Adam. Adam, where are you? Are you trying to hide from me? To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife. Now, wait, that's not the curse, okay? Wait. Because you listened to your wife and ate. Get it in context. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you. You know, Adam was the one that the command was given to. About which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed, here you go. Cursed is work. No, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Okra. I just want to say that. The curse was on the earth. It was now going to be difficult and burdensome and tiring and frustrating and depressing and discouraging because so much toil, so little fruit because of sin. Are you understanding this? Work wasn't meant to be that way. Work itself is not the, the, the problem. The problem was our hearts. We started to disobey. There was rebellion. There was sin. And that created the tiresome, burdensome, difficult, frustrating, discouraging, depressing work. Work itself was not a curse, but the suffering brought by sin was. Get that clear? In the New Testament, we, we, you know, some people will say, well, you know, it's, it's the cross I must bear. Jesus said, take up your cross. No, no, no. The, Jesus was not talking about work as your cross, the cross that you must bear. Oh, I have to work. I have to go to work. I have to go to the office. I have to report to my job. Yeah, so that's hard. Huh? Yeah, I know, because it's, it's the cross I have to bear. Number one, that's out of context. It is difficult, it is hard, not because of work itself, but because we have sinned that we have made life on earth difficult together with the rest of humanity. Paul actually encouraged Christians to work. Amen? We will see it all in the New Testament. Second Thessalonians 3.10, I didn't put it there, but Second Thessalonians 3.10, Paul was actually telling the, them in very strong words, for even when we were with you, Paul says, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. What? <laughs> if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And the Bible, Old and New Testament, is full of verses that encourage work. It cannot be cursed. It is encouraged and even commanded that we work. It's not the curse. The curse is brought about by sin. And sin brings about things like this. Laziness, idleness, sloth. All of these things are brought about by sin in our hearts, which has cursed the ground, making it more difficult. So you're wondering why I'm frustrated, tired, and, and weary at work? It's not because of work itself. It's sin that has entered the world. If you look at it as a curse, you will say, I have to avoid work. I'll be miserable at work. If your attitude is like that, wow, it will be a curse for you. 
This is HR manager tells a young applicant, I'm sorry, we can't hire you today. There's just, you know, no work here for you to do. The applicant smartly replies, oh, no work? No problem. Perfect. If you hire me, I promise I won't ask for any work. Just hire me, please. <clears throat> Nobody seems to be appreciating anymore their job. This is the culture we're in. Look at your work. When you get to work, what do, what do people usually do at work? I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people at work, what do they do? They just, 90% 90, 90 of the time, just griping, complaining about their work. Right? Hey, how are you? I'm good. Here. Work. That's why we hate Mondays. Hey, it's a holiday tomorrow. God bless you. <laughs> but there's Tuesday. You're going to go back to work. Unless you develop the right attitude towards it. Oh, your Monday is going to feel like Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. We need to change the way we're looking at work. If you're looking at work as a curse, you will avoid it. You will be miserable in it, even if your job is paying you 100000 a year. Is that good? Is that how much you guys are making? Yeah, nice. You'll still be miserable. It's not the amount of money. It's your attitude towards it. Because I've seen people that are fulfilled and enjoying work, and they're only getting like 20000 a year. Because they have a different attitude towards work. Hmm, we'll talk about that a little later. Nobody seems to appreciate their job anymore. It seems normal sometimes to have a negative attitude towards work. And it's abnormal for you to smile at work. Morning, yeah, morning, great day to work. It's usually your boss that does that, right? Or even if your boss is like that, sometimes we're just grumpy. We gather around the water cooler with our mask on. And we're, what do we do? We're still complaining. We're still whining about work. From top to bottom, the executives and the owners in your company, down to rank and file, down to the lowest uh, person. They, they, you just have to complain about work. And sometimes it's just a bad culture, bad culture overall. It's a bad atmosphere to work in, toxic, some people will describe it as. Do you have that kind of a workplace? <laughs> Are you contributing to that kind of a culture? <sighs> Maybe it stems from a, a bad view, perspective of work as painful punishment. Maybe coming from your view that it's a curse. Number two, you can also look at work simply as a paid profession, a means to an end, or it's simply a contract. It's a contract. I signed it. I go to work. Nine to five, sometimes nine, to nine, but that's okay. <clears throat> you call it a necessary evil. You say, and you have this mentality, and it's also a little toxic. I don't like to work, but I have to. <laughs> Let me give you a few thoughts here already. This stems from looking at your work as, this is my secular occupation, as opposed to my sacred duty. I mean, you know, sacred duty is 10 to 11 on a Sunday morning. One hour versus 50 plus hours a week of the secular occupation. Imagine yourself spending all that time in a place that you don't really like to be in. Or in a place that you think you should not be in. If you spend a lot of time at work with that attitude, no wonder it's contributing to the stress and the worry, anxiety. You want it because you need it, but you don't like it. This contributes to the unhappiness and the frustration of a lot of people in the workplace. There's a thinking that I should not be here. I was created for happiness. <laughs> Have you heard that? Have you told that to yourself? 
I don't deserve this. I'm not happy. And for many things in life, that's a problem. When you're looking at this and you're always thinking, I'm not happy here. Where can I be happy? You're looking at your marriage, I'm not happy here. Where can I be happy? You're looking at your job, I'm not happy here. Where can I be happy? If your perspective is always just your happiness, there's going to be a problem. Amen? Some of you are like, what do wrong? I mean, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That could be why. <laughs> what happens is that you're looking forward to a time. It's called retirement. Everyone's just looking forward to retirement, calculating the, uh, the number of years, the number of weeks, the number of months, the number of hours before your retirement. Retirement becomes like an ultimate goal. By the time I retire, I, want, I need to have reached a level of success. And, and when you say success, it's getting the most that you can get while you can get it so you can enjoy the most after you're done with it. <laughs> That's a bad definition of success. Success will be defined as getting the most that you can get while you can get it so you can enjoy the most while, when you're done with it. That's just too utilitarian. What an attitude. No wonder after 8 hours, 10 hours at work, you come home, oh, I can't wait to retire. How many more? 40 more years of this. Little more. If I can only endure. So after 2020, whoa, 39 more years. Wow, that's, that's a poor way to enjoy the abundant life. If you're looking at work simply to make it through as a contract that this is my job, this is my career, that's separate from who I am as a Christian, then you're really going to suffer. <clears throat> it's that dual life that's the problem. The secular versus the sacred. Monday to Friday, you work. Saturday, you, fam you have family. Sunday, part of it is for God. And everything else in between is for me. Have you used that term, me time? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you having a lot of me time. How is that working out for you? One of our problems in life is that we divide everything into secular and sacred categories. Not very helpful in terms of a good perspective, a paradigm of work. We say that over here is the secular, over there is sacred. And we spend the best hours of our every day in the secular world. And we say we'd really like to serve God, but we have to spend so much time in our secular job. So I can't because we separated it. You separated in your mind what is for the Lord and what is for yourself and for your goals and for your success. You've separated what you've defined as success versus what you've defined as the Christian life. That's the danger. There's a tendency in us to define success and our identity only in terms of our job and profession. No wonder there are people that when they lose their job, and there's a lot of you that have lost it, they suddenly lose their identity. I mean, it's normal to grieve that, to mourn that, to, to suffer a little loss of that. And, and, and I pray you have a community around you help you get through it. But if your, your identity, your self-worth, and your success, have you, have you, how, how you have defined it, is related to the kind of work you do, and that's where you're getting the source of identity and success, then you have a problem. Because there will be an overemphasis on position, on your pay, on the prestige of your job or the power and the influence of that job. And you know that's up and down. You can't have up and down source of joy and pure joy does not come from your profession. What happens, you concentrate too much on it and you become... That becomes the source of happiness or fulfillment, self-worth. No wonder some people are called workaholics. Some people, you call them alcoholics, they're like, wow, call me that. 
You call them drug addicts. Oh. oh. Shopaholic. Oh, too materialistic. But you call them workaholic. They actually are proud of it. I'm a workaholic. I just don't have the time. We talked about this a little before. That's nothing to be proud of. Any holic, whether you're a shopaholic, workaholic, alcoholic, churchaholic. Yeah, any of those addictions, anything that gets the attention away from God, anything that is the source of fulfillment, of joy, of success for you that is not found in Christ, you will definitely get into a problem. If you're looking at your work simply as a means to provide, and that's all. I just want my, my bills paid. I just want to have that salary on the 15th and the 30th. I just want to be able to pay off this one, this one. Oh, I'm Joe, so looking forward to retirement. What a way to live. It's tiring. I'm not saying you're in sin. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying that's a tiring way to look at life. You're not going to make it past 42. That rate, you're going to burn out. I'm going to be 42 soon when I go back again. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's tiring, right? That Those dangers you need to avoid. We have relegated God to a Sunday morning activity, and then we have put everything else in terms of work because we need to be successful. As a footnote, it's for the Lord. When it comes to our career, most of us have our dream job and we have our real job. <laughs> How did you end up in the job that you have? How did you end up in the career choice that you made? Would you describe yourself as, a ha as happy with that choice, as fulfilled with that choice? Do you look forward to working? Have you considered the link between your work and how that impacts, impacts your work or your walk with Christ. Ask yourself, where is God in my work? Where is God in my work? Then you get to the third, a more healthy perspective on this. Work is being something that is you're passionately purposeful with it. It's like calling. It's a vocation. More than just something that pays the bills, of course, definitely not just a curse, but it's a blessing to be enjoyed. I'm going to put it all there. A blessing to be enjoyed. Of course, if your job falls within the limits of what God calls pleasing to Him. Oh, Pastor, you mean there are jobs that are not pleasing to Him? Yes, of course. If your job involves sin, I mean, if your job involves sin and spreads sin and draws people into sin, I'm not going to enumerate any job. It's dangerous. could be any job. But when I say it's a blessing to be enjoyed, I mean it's a source of dignity for you. You find true fulfillment. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about joy, pure inward joy. And growth, personally. As your needs are provided for, of course, we're not talking about greed. We're talking about providing your, for your needs and the needs of your loved ones. And of course, it could also be a bridge for the gospel. A way that I'm able to relate to God through relating to others. A bridge for the gospel. If you look at work as part of your life that God has blessed with purpose, with intentionality, approach each day, each day dedicated to Him. Yes, Jesus is my boss. Pastor, that's easier said. I know a lot of these things easier said than done. <clears throat> our being created in God's image leads directly to our privilege and duty to subdue the earth and to take what God has made and shape it and use it for God's good purposes. Take what you have. That's not, that's not forever, your job. Even if you've been there 20 years, 30 years, or you're going to retire with that job, that's okay. 
if you see that job, that profession, that career as something that is from God and something that leads you back to the very purpose of God for your life, then it will start to have meaning. It will start to have significance. It will move you towards the direction of growth and fulfillment. Again, it's not money I'm talking about. Hopefully, it involves money that provides for you. Not, that, not money that feeds your greed, but money that is able to provide for you and you're able to bless others. <clears throat> you have to have a good, healthy view of work. Find meaning and purpose. The meaning of purpose is not found in you or the mission statement of your work. It's, it's found in God. He created you. Created you for a purpose. There was one father kept bringing his work from home with him. His six-year-old asked him, you know, why do you keep bringing your home with you, Dad? Can't play with you. Can't do anything because you're always working. Daddy explained, uh, you know, I couldn't finish it, you know, during the day. I work only nine, ten hours a day. And there's a lot more work I need to do and need to bring it home. The child thought for a moment. Hmm, because he's in first grade now. So, Dad, why don't they just put you in the slower group? Because you're slow. Why don't they just put you in the slower group? That's what they do in our school. <laughs> so you keep bringing stuff at home. Maybe you should join the slower group. What do I mean when we're blessed because of our work? There's provision. There's excellence in your work. There's compassion. Oh, when you have a duality, when you have secular versus sacred, what you do is, oh, I'm excellent at work. But, you know, when it comes to, there, there's no duality with it. When you're excellent, you're excellent at work, excellent at play, excellent at church. Excellence is a virtue uh, that, that you exhibit even in your work. Then you will find blessing and fulfillment. Provisions for your needs, compassion towards others. Oh, I know a lot of people that are very generous. You know why? Because they're, God has been providing for them. They're excellent at their work, and they're getting the promotions. They're getting the right pay, and they're able to bless, support the work of the Lord, and able to bless others in generosity. Because they're being excellent at work, they have the right attitude towards money and towards work. Mm. But if you're, if you're, can you imagine if your view is simply to, to, to collect and to collect and to collect, to build, to build for yourself, then there's no room for generosity and compassion towards others. Oh, yes. I know a lot of people that are rich, and they're not necessarily the most generous. Amen. And I know a lot of people that are poor as far as the world is concerned. But in their hearts, there's excellence and generosity. So it has nothing to do with the amount. The blessings is in the provision, compassion, the excellence, the joy, and the dignity of your work. A lot of people will tell you, you come to America, there's dignity of work. You ask an American, is there dignity in your work? Is there dignity in your labor? Are you finding significance and joy because you understand your work is part of God's creation and this is what I do in contribution to my stewardship of the world. I serve Jesus through my work. You have to be able to say this. I serve Jesus through my work and he blesses me and all I represent through my work. That's nice. I'm not sure if I put that here. I did. I serve Jesus through my work and he blesses me and all I represent. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why you need to be excellent at work. Not just excellent in terms of what you do and what you produce. Excellent in terms of your attitude and perspective about it. Young people, excellence at work. Older people, oh, no one here. Excellence at work. Those of you that are in between jobs, excellence at work. Develop it. Take the time to get the right attitude. Read the Bible. Read up on what the Bible says about work. And then get into the kind of work, the kind of business that God has willed for you. This is important. Your work 
matters. Your work matters to God. Look at the person to your left. Or that. Those of you online, look at the person to your left. Or your work matters. And then you answer back to them, your work matters to God. Hallelujah. Going back to Signalman Staples, and I'm about to end with this. Navy Signalman Staples, remember him? He and his surviving crewmates, the USS Astoria, were rescued again, <laughs> second time that night, by the USS President Jackson. They were evacuated to New Caledonia. You're wondering where this is. This is near New Zealand, New Guinea, the Pacific, uh, South Pacific. After some time in the hospital, he was granted the leave, and he went home to his mom in Akron, Ohio. When he got home, he visited his mom. Mom's name, Vera Mueller Staples. And he relayed his harrowing story to his mom over dinner. He even brought home that inflatable life belt that saved his life. Twice. Her mom jumped up. What? Did you say inflatable rubber life belt? Oh, goosebumps. While you were at war, son, I took a job at Firestone, Akron, Ohio. Firestone as an inspector, a quality control officer, an inspector of inflatable rubber life belts. Wow. Staples hurries out to his room, comes back in, with the life belt that saved his life to show his mom. They, they look at the tag, true enough, it was made by Firestone. Then they looked at the, the manufacturing plant, true enough, it was manufactured in Akron, Ohio, Firestone plant, where she was working. Then they looked at the serial number, and the inspection control number. You know the inspection control number. After everything goes through her, she would stamp her number on it so that when something goes wrong, they can trace it back to who approved it, who checked it, who checked the quality control of that. Guess what? When they looked at the serial number and the inspection control number, it was her mom's number. Her excellence at work. Check, fact check this. Go ahead, fact check it. Firestone, Akron, Ohio, Elgin Staples. You know you will, right? Some of you are doing that right now. Go ahead. Her excellence at work and uncompromising excellence at work actually saved his son's life. Brothers and sisters, what you do matters. I want to encourage you. What you do, but, but pastor, do you know what I do? I can't even describe it, pastor. It's, it's so menial, it's so trivial, it's so small. What you do matters. What you do matters, that's why you have to do it excellently every time. I'm not sure if your life or someone you loved will depend on it. But you know where it matters? It matters in the eyes of God. Amen? Excellence at work. Let me give you the review here. Mm. Work is not a curse. It's not just a contract. It's actually a calling. Now, in a fallen world, no job satisfies completely. Ours may be mostly fulfilling or maybe minimally so. When we sense God's calling, though, when we sense God's purpose, all of that fades into the background. It doesn't really matter in eternity. For through our jobs, through our profession, through our gig, if you want to call it that, we honor Him and we accomplish His purposes. 